All right, this week on the Punks on Pizza podcast, I am super stoked to bring you here, Mr. Phil Calvert. This guy is the original drummer for the Boys Next Door, the birthday party. He now runs his own record company from Australia. Super excited to be here with you this evening. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing, I'm doing good, thanks, Tyler. It's, uh, it's probably a little warmer than what it is where you are, you know. I mean, it's, uh, you've got winter there, and we're still just at the end of summer or the beginning of autumn, so I've been doing a bit of gardening this afternoon. Uh, fortunately, on the island, it's a lot better than mid-Canada, but uh, yeah, yeah, we moved out here to escape that. But, <laughs> all right, um, so I obviously wanted to ask you a few questions about uh, the bands you have partaken in and what's been going on in your life. I figured yep, sure. the best place to start is the beginning. I've mapped this out kind of chronologically as much as possible. Okay. All right. We'll start here then. I was wondering if you could recall your earliest memories uh, when forming the Boys Next Door, like that first jam session, if you could recall that, and or the first live show. Oh, well, okay. So, well, you know, uh, four of us, we all, we all went to school together. So we were in, in high school together. And we had various bands through high school where we play at school dances and uh, play in like, you know, local halls and things like that. So, uh, and that was a lot of, uh, you know, mostly covers with a few originals that just sounded exactly like the covers. Um, so, you know, it was very influenced by, um, you know, Bowie and Roxy Music and Sensational Alex Harvey Band. And uh, then I think, The, the kind of we had five guys uh, in the band at that stage it was another guitar player uh, he went off uh, after we finished uh, high school and started going to university uh, he sort of went off overseas with his, his family and uh, went to America for a while so he kind of wasn't around and we were still playing jamming as a four piece uh, and uh, I think you know we were all very you know, all had our heads in music magazines, all had our heads in what was going on in England or in America. And, uh, you know, we just started to hear and see a whole lot more of what was going to be the kind of punk and new wave movement out of uh, New York City initially. Uh, you know, uh, bands, I suppose, like, you know, Blondie and then the early Ramon stuff and the uh television and talking heads and things so we were hearing these kind of sounds and this was turning our heads away from our more proficient uh, uh you know musicians that we've been kind of previously listening to so yeah we started to turn in, in that kind of direction so we started playing a lot rougher and playing a lot faster and started covering things like my generation by the who and uh you know and then we did you know we did gloria and we did you know like a, but then we also covered a few ramon songs and then we started writing our own stuff, but the very kind of first, we, we, we had a, a date to play at this like local hall, which was actually the, the church hall of where uh, Mick, Mick Harvey's dad was a minister. And uh, so that it, he lived at, you know, they had a house next to the church and there was a, a hall there and we'd arranged to play a Saturday night there and everyone in the neighborhood knew we were playing. So we played there. That was pretty kind of rough and tumble. It was a bit of a fight at the end of it. Uh, but uh, not long after that, we played at a place called Swinburne Institute of Technology, and we played a, a, a show there. And that's probably the first show of The Boys Next Door as such. Uh, there is a really rough uh, tape recording of that. It's uh, available places. You can bootleg, you can find it. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's still on cassette. It's probably, you can probably get a download now. I don't know. But uh, it's, you know, it's uh, us, just us playing Fast and Furious and uh, being, yeah, and that, that was probably the first thing where we would probably have said for, you know, for about three or four months when we probably described ourselves as being punk, you know, but uh, uh, it, it, yeah, I think it was just, you know, you, you're influenced by what you're listening to and what's fresh and, and, what, and, and what gets you excited. And so then you start to follow in those footsteps kind of thing. Now, how, uh, how did the record deal come about and went about with uh, okay, so the, the first, uh, um, so we, we were playing around town. Uh, we started playing in pubs and uh, there was a guy uh, called Keith Glass. He owned a record store and we used to spend a lot of time in that record store. It's where we, you know, read all our mail order NMEs and stuff with it. 
that paying for them. And, uh, you know, so I bought records there and stuff. But Keith had a band and he had a Wednesday night residency at a pub. And he said, hey, you know, um, you, I'll, I'll play the first spot and the last spot. And you guys play, you know, the set in the middle kind of thing. So we, we started playing at this pub. And then the, the, the booker of that pub started giving us some other gigs. Anyway, one night we're, we're doing this, this sh- we've played this show and we're in the band room afterwards. We're all sweaty and we've got a beer. And, and this guy walks in and I swear to God, He's got a, a fringe suede jacket on and a whole lot of Navajo jewelry. And uh, he goes, hey, guys, uh, what, what did he say? He said, um, uh, I, I'm Barry Earl. I go, oh, yeah, OK, so we don't know who this character is. And he goes, um, he goes, have you ever seen that scene in a movie where the guy goes into the young band and says, I'm going to make you guys stars? I mean, yeah, he goes, I'm that guy. <laughs> So what had happened is he'd been over in England and he'd seen a whole lot of what was going on there. And he'd come back and convinced a guy at a record label here uh, to, to form a, like a, a spin-off label, uh, kind of modeled a bit on stiff. And they were going to kind of just get young bands from all around Australia and do this kind of sampler. So they made this album called lethal weapons and you know we had three tracks on it another band had a lot of other bands had two or one track on it um and you know some of those guys all went on to be in other things later and stuff as well uh but that was kind of going okay Uh, it was it didn't kind of they were trying to manufacture us and we weren't having too much fun with that but what then happened was they said, okay, so we've got this record deal. And they said, well, so, to keep the ball rolling, we'll put you guys in the studio because you got enough material to do an album. So they put us in the studio and we recorded a whole album. Uh, and uh, that was all sounded like the first side of Door Door, the first kind of Boys Next Door LP. And there was uh, 10 songs on that, uh, of which there are five outtakes, which are no longer there. But what happened was, uh, after we had finished recording this, t- these 10 tracks, um, things were kind of going sour between Barry Earl and the record company and nothing was selling and the Lethal Weapons record hadn't sold well at all and uh, no one was really getting any traction except we were getting a good live following. And so they shelved the record. Uh, and while the record was shelved and we were still playing, this is around the time where uh, Roland joins the band. So Roland had previously been in a band called the Young Charlatans. We knew Roland, he was in a band before that. Um, was he in the Obsessions with Ollie? I can't remember. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but we knew Roland from around. He was like one of the guys who was at our shows and at parties that we went to after shows and stuff. And so um, Roland joined the band. This gave us a whole brace of new songs. Uh, like, you know, all of a sudden we had another 15 new songs and we could play, you know, three sets and it was, yeah. And we were working a lot and pulling quite a live following. And uh, then the guys at Mushroom, now Suicide no longer exists, the guys at Mushroom went, oh, fuck, these guys are, you know, they're, they're packing out rooms. We should put that record out. And then we went, holy shit, we don't even sound like that anymore, you know? So uh, to his credit, the guy at Mushroom, Michael Kodinsky, said, i tell you what, guys, I'll give you five nights of downtime in a studio with this engineer. Uh, it's going to cost me 2000 So it's going to be in advance. You, you know, you pay him more money, but, and then you can do stuff that's more representative of what you're doing now. And we'll make a mix out of the best tracks from that and the best tracks from now. And that's what happened with that record. And why it's split with the first side. Rolling yeah, yes. Yeah. So side one is the stuff for, which is just the four of us. Side two is the stuff where we're doing uh, the after fashion and shivers and I mistake myself and stuff like that, which is where we're getting, we're starting at this point, you're hearing the, the influence of Roland's guitar and stuff like that. Uh, and we're starting to sound, uh, you know, a lot moodier and a lot less power pop kind of thing. You know, we're, we're starting to head towards where we're going to go. Now that album came out in, uh, oh, like April or something like that of 1979. Um, and by, uh, by the time it actually came out, the label was already about to drop us. Uh, so what happened was uh, Keith Glass, who also had a record label called Missing Link, I believe he may have discussed it with Michael and said, hey, let him out of the deal, right? 
you've got that record for whatever, you know, whatever sells that's all yours. Let them out of the deal and I'll take them over. And so that's what happened. And basically earlier in that year, whilst we were, I mean, Door Door still hadn't actually come out. We were already talking to Keith and Keith was going, you guys have got to get out of this, out of Australia. You got to go to England because that's where you're going to, that's where your sound's going to work. And because he was importing records and he was going to the UK, you know, two, three times a year to buy and, you know, bring in all, all those great indie singles that were coming out at that point in time. So, you know, he, um, uh, Keith said, we've got to hatch a plan. Uh, we're going to get you, you know, to the UK by Christmas. Well, we didn't get there till the end of February the next year, but we basically saved all our money from our live gigs. Uh, and Keith then put us uh, in the studio. We did the, uh, the Hee Haw EP, <clears throat> it came out within about, you know, a month or two of Door Door having sort of come and gone. And, you know, they, they wouldn't play Shivers on the TV because it had this line about committing suicide, you know, and stuff like that. And so that was all, which is really dumb. Uh, but anyway, uh, so then we recorded Hee Haw and, yeah, we were either on the road or in the studio from kind of April, May, of 79 until we left on uh, the 29th of February uh, 1980 and moved to London. And one other thing I will point out as well also is that the second side of Door Door, and it's I just find this amazing because I, um, I got interviewed, but well, there's this book that came out quite recently about, about Nick and it, uh, there's a few quotes from, it, from me and stuff like that. And I had to be interviewed by the, the cat who wrote it, but I never kind of put two and two together. See, Nick's dad died tragically in a car accident. And yeah. it's like, it's like three days later, we're in the studio doing the second side of Door Door. Or, or it's within a week. Anyway, and I don't even remember anybody going, hey, how are you going, Nick? You know, that's really rough about you. We, you know, we were 20 year old guys. You just didn't do that. It was just the music was the music. And, and when I think back on it now, you know, I should have gone put my arm around him going, fuck, how you going, man? This, this must be really, you know, tearing you up. And and we didn't. We just didn't do that sort of stuff. You know, we just went on, just kept going, you know. Um, and when I, when I, you know, because it was Mark was tell, into the guy who wrote this book. He's going, oh, well, yeah, because Nick's dad died here, blah, blah, blah. And then you're here. And then this happened. I go, fucking hell. You know, I didn't, I didn't even put it together. But anyway, next question. What do you got? <laughs> No, it's funny. I actually I started reading Mark Murdo's book and I had read that that part about his dad. So it's funny that you, you bring that up. But uh, no, well, I want Nick, to ask Nick about hasn't it. had it easy, man. I mean, Jesus Christ, you know, then you know, a couple of years back his kid fucking falls off a cliff. It just man, it breaks yeah. my heart, you know. And then, you know, uh, you know, a couple of months back during COVID, like Anita died and yeah, it's yeah. You know, you know, for people from my generation, uh, some of them are kind of checking out at the moment, you know. <laughs> oh, well, it's good to see you healthy and kicking. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I'm, uh, uh, I, I, I avoid, I avoided some of the, uh, the ills of, uh, of my compatriots. And I think that uh, kept me in uh, slightly better shape. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, talking about some of uh, the people you played with and grew up with actually leads. Uh, I know the Saints get brought up a lot, but I was wondering if there were any other kind of, uh, kind of rivalries between bands that maybe didn't get as big during those times. In a, like in, it's really funny in the Melbourne kind of new wave punk scene or whatever, like 77, 78, 79, um, there wasn't really a lot of rivalry per se we all kind of knew each other um i guess we just probably thought we were better than everybody else and they probably thought they probably all thought they were all better than us so it was like quite a healthy kind of competition and uh you know and a lot of those guys you know still are you know good friends and, and things like that i mean the saints you know they're from brisbane uh we loved them when they came down here uh, and we saw them live but then you know they went to england you know and then they kind of went around um there was a band here from Sydney uh, called Radio Burman. They were kind of like a de heavy Detroit rock type band. And they they actually, I went and saw them early on. I said, man, how can a band have so many good songs? And then I found out, of course, it was all Blue Oyster Cult, MC5, <laughs> Flame and Groovies. You know, it's like, I, I just didn't know the records yet. That's all, you know. And uh, 
And then you realize oh, they only got four originals, right? And then the rest are all just really well chosen covers. But they were, uh, and they were, um, they they gave they were probably bigger than us, earlier than us, and gave us a lot of um, support slots, which is quite good. And there was a band in Melbourne uh, called The Sports. They were kind of more like a, a a stiff kind of like Graham Parker and the Rumor kind of kind of band. Uh, and uh, they used to give us a lot of opening slots. They, they they had quite a big following, but they used to give us a lot of uh, opening uh, spots on tours and things like that. But no, I mean, uh, I was, yeah, I mean, Australia, you know, it wasn't any real rivalry per se. I suppose we might have been trying to outdo each other and stuff like that, but it was all pretty friendly, you know. All right now, Nick has famously kind of blasted the Door Door album, referring to it as a wank, more so knocking his vocals and uh, his writing than anybody's playing. I was just wondering how, after all these years, that album sits with you. Um, I'm fine with it. You know, I think, uh, uh, I think it was just it was part of us getting to where we eventually got, kind of thing. Um, I've got really fond memories of uh, particularly more so of side two than side one. I didn't like the guy who was uh, producing and engineering on, on the side one stuff, Les Karski, but I did. Um, uh, it was the side two is the first time we got to work with Tony Cohen. And I think that that's where we started to uh, learn and understand much more how to use uh, the studio as an instrument as well kind of thing we were less in awe of it and Tony was very hands-on and also we used to mix with you know no automation with five guys crowded around the board with everyone having their designated charts you know you've got to push the mutes here and then pan that to there and then when you get to that that fader has to go up to here and like we were kind of like all leaning over me you know trying to get the mix to work and and that that, that gives you a lot more insight into that kind of stuff and yeah, you know, a lot of people go, oh, you know, that version of Shivers isn't the best version of Shivers and Roland should have sung it. No, I, I still reckon that's the best version and I like the way Nick sings it. So, yeah, yeah. It's all good with me. Uh, for the recordings that eventually did get released uh, for the Hee Haw compilation, I was wondering what the conversation was like kind of in studio because the sound was so drastically different and changing towards what would become the birthday party sound. Yeah, what, uh, so what did you start out by talking about the Hee Haw record or what, what was that you said? Yeah, the recordings that came from uh, those sessions, I was just wondering what conversations were like as towards where the music was going. Oh no, we, I mean, that was, that was a really exciting period when we got, uh, back in the studio and we had much more free reign and we knew we weren't there trying to make something that was going to work on the you know the radio we, we were making stuff that was for you know what was for the people that, that we thought we were going to be playing with in in the UK and stuff like that and we go that that's the market where we're going this is the sound we were going to take there and we wanted people to pay attention to it so I think also at this point you know uh, the things we were listening to were much more things like uh, you know, the pop group and Perubu and, uh, you know, the Red Crayola and maybe early you know, bits of the fall and stuff like that. And, um, uh, and, and, and I, I think that was, you know, the, the, the whole idea of being much more experimental uh, with the, the stuff and, and uh, pushing the boundaries with the, you know, the sounds and we were doing stuff like you know, putting bits of metal, like doing kind of like prepared piano, like John Cage. We're putting cymbals and bits of metal and like stand across the strings of the piano. And, uh, you know, we were doubling snare drums with uh, uh, hitting like paint tin lids with, with screwdrivers and shit like that. You know, we were just trying to, to get, because we, you know, you hear a lot of those crazy sounds, uh, especially when things started getting quite dubby in the English sound and they started doing a lot of stuff with delays and, and things like that, then we were going, how are they getting those sounds? So we had to go, well, it sounds like a guy's hitting a metal thing with a screwdriver. Let's do that kind of thing. So it was, um, those, those sessions were fantastic, but the ones after, um, like the uh, Friend Catcher, Mr. Clarinet, um, Riddle House, Happy Birthday, those songs, which became like the first couple of singles we put out in the UK you know each time we did a new song it was continuing to go somewhere else and uh 
yeah, the, the, the thing is then, of course, we went to England. Uh, we were away for 10 months or something or other like that. And in that 10 months while we were away, the band just completely evolved into a, a whole other being kind of thing. But, but from that starting point, you know, we went, um, because also we worked under very difficult conditions there. Uh, we didn't have the rehearsal spaces like we did in Australia. We, we only played 11 shows in the first year in England. And we were used to playing, you know, in Australia, we'd play, you know, 80 to 100 shows a year. You know, that, that was normal for us kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and then uh, I remember when I came back from uh, England and I had a tape of the uh, first Peel session that we did, uh, which had four songs on it that were all going to end up on Prez on Fire anyway. And uh, my uh, best mate who I, I was staying at his house once I got back from England and I said, oh, and I played it to him. He goes, who's this? And I go, oh, this is us. And he's go, you know, he's going, wow. He said, that's such a departure from the band I waved goodbye to 10 months ago kind of thing, you know. And so that being in England really changed it. Uh, and, and the way we had to write and everything like that. And then we came back to Australia and we were so like, we just got in the studio and just exploded, you know. We were full of stuff, you know, from, from not doing stuff, you know. Was there a single moment that you can recall where you're like, okay, the boys next door are done. This is now the birthday party. I I think that I think that happened that happened a long time before. I mean, we it officially happened when we went to England, but I think musically it changed around the kind of hee haw stage. I think that's when the band became more like the birthday party, uh, and I I think it was very hard to change our name without there being like a real kind of line in the sand and I think getting on a plane and leaving the country was so we'd already picked the name before we went uh and we knew it was going to be that but I think we even still played all of our last shows before we left we're still all under the name of the boys next door because we just confuse people you know otherwise now uh you were talking about uh entering a more experimental stage I've read plenty of uh comparisons between uh some of the later hee-haw uh era stuff like Mr. Clarinet, those kind of, uh, well, that was later, uh, to Captain Beefheart. And I was wondering, because I've never heard any of the band members actually mention him by name. Was he ever an influence? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Nick was lifting, listening to a bit of that. I certainly know later on, because uh, around that time, uh, 80, 81, Doc at the Radar Station came out. And I, I know Nick was definitely listening to that. Um, but, you know, I used to work in a record store. So, uh, you know, I, I'd heard plenty of The Captain and, uh, you know, I, you know, I didn't like Zappa. I liked, I liked, you know, Beef Art, you know, sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, Keith was really um, uh, cool with, you know, playing us records and stuff like that, you know. Uh, I, he's probably the reason we did that cover of Catman because he played us the Gene Vincent version. Um, uh, you know, he played he played us things like the Fugs and stuff like that. You know, uh, and and even really dumbass stuff like the Shags. But it was more kind of like, you know, how far you can push things in in making records. Now, uh, both Door Door and Prayers on Fire were recorded in Australia. What were the major differences that you noticed between once you were started recording from Australia to when you took go like went over to England? Yeah, the English. Um, uh, I think the the uh, well, you know, most of Junkyard was also done in Australia as well, but some of it was finished. Oh no, no, sorry, there was three three tracks actually recorded in England as well. Um, I like the English studios. I like the English studio system. Um, uh, I think the first time we really encountered it, besides um, when we did stuff with the BBC, when the Peel sessions, uh, was when we went into the release the bats, uh, and that was Townhouse Two, which is a really awesome studio, um, and it's where you know it's like it's you know it's where Phil Collins tracked the drum, the famous drum break, and all that kind of stuff. It's like it's you know, and I was doing drums in that room and all that sort of junk, um, but. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, we were working with this guy, Nick Lorne, and he pulled really great sounds. But in England, you have a guy just sits next to the tape machine 
so that the producer and the engineer don't have to actually, you know, run the transport and press the buttons and go, you know, stop, rewind and all that. And, you know, and, and, and the, you know, the, the producer go down back to the beginning of verse one. And it's just like, he doesn't have to take his head away from what he's doing, do that as well. In Australia, you have one guy, he's, he's sitting at the board, he runs the whole fucking thing, you know? Uh, so I wasn't used to that English studio system where they have there, where everyone's kind of uh, coming up like an apprenticeship. So there's a guy who basically goes, gets beers and makes a cup of tea. He also is there for the whole day, but one day he'll get to operate the tape machine. And then, you know, a year later, he'll get to engineer a session because they all learn their, their way up. But um, yeah, I, I think, you know, if Tony had have been in the UK, I think he, he, you know, he should have been a much more highly respected uh, uh, producer and engineer than, than probably what he ended up because uh he pulled amazing sounds, but then so did the guys in England. You know, uh, yeah, they use different mics. There's, um, uh, but mostly I think it's that, um, yeah, they've got those big old English boards and they've got those, um, you know, they've got their, just their ways. I mean, I've never seen, I, I hit a Tom mic and I said, oh, we'll redo the take. And the engineer said, no, no, no. They just found it on the multi-track, marked it up with Chinagraph pencil rub the reels back and forth, flipped out the tape, got a razor blade, just cut a slot out of the tape. <laughs> I've never seen that done before. I cut a little slot like that out of a two inch. I've never seen it done before, but that's England. They do different shit. How, uh, how did your family take it when you uh, guys finally, when you did move to England? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I was, um, uh, my father's English, but uh, he was born in Cairo and stuff like that. He was always keen for my sister and myself to travel, but he was never a fan of uh, me being in the music business. He thought I was wasting my time and my life and stuff. Uh, there was a time, quite a lengthy period in my life where he didn't speak to me. And uh, this was just part of that period. So basically they saw me off at the airport and everything like that. Um, you know, there was quite a bit of letter writing going uh back and forth but uh uh yeah my dad was never very supportive of uh of my musical pursuits so uh you know if i was cold and starving and hungry he certainly wasn't sending me any money so you know <laughs> but that's okay i got a job in a shop you know sold some jeans you know did that shit you know for the first year and a bit and after that i didn't need to anymore because the band was actually making money then um, okay, the England days, uh, from what I've read, obviously, being, uh, the audiences became increasingly violent over the years. I was just wondering if there was any stand Sorry, you just froze it. Sorry, you, you just froze it. You said it became increasingly what? Oh, that uh, audiences had become increasingly violent over the years. And I was just wondering if you have any uh, standout memories of coming to England where it was like an exceptionally frightening in comparison to home well no it's really interesting because initially because it was that sort of in 80 and the first more in 80 um when we only played 10 or 11 shows people freaking sat on the floor or just stood there with their hands in their pockets and stared at you uh, the, the english audiences were really tame but uh and then we'd come back to Australia and it would be hot and sweaty in summer and the Australian audiences were much more like into it. And I, I think it was when we came back and we were recording Prayers on Fire and we were touring that summer, uh, Nick became very confrontational with the audience. This is when he started, you know, ripping his shirt off. This is when he started painting things on his chest and stuff. And this is when he started jumping into the audience. Now, I've got to tell you, pretty much I reckon the, uh, the chest painting uh, the ripping the shirt off and the jumping in the audience are all pretty much Lux Interior because uh, one of the first bands we saw uh, when we arrived in England, oh, I wasn't actually, it was, it was after a while, but the Cramps, we saw the Cramps play at the venue and Lux was fantastic, you know, and uh, oh, he did this thing where he, um, he got people to take off their shoes and he was putting other people's shoes in other parts and then just, you know, People, you know, he's going, don't worry, it'll all work out. You'll all get your shoe back. And then he'd get back on stage and no, he just kept singing the fucking song. It was, that was dumb. But um, yeah, uh, we did. But I went and saw some English bands. Like about the second night we were in, in London, we went to uh, the Marquee and we saw The Cure. 
And uh, The Cure were doing the kind of three imaginary boys set. And uh, they were really good and they were really tight. And I was going, wow, man, if every band that I've got a record of from London can actually play this tight, we're in for a bit of a fucking challenge here, you know. Uh, but then, you know, a few days later, I went to the Lyceum and I saw a teardrop explodes and echo on the Bunnyman. And then I went to the Music Machine and saw Susie and the Banshees. And they were all really dreadfully bad live. So, you, you know, they made much better records than they did live. So The Cure would stand out at being a really tight live act. But a lot of the other ones weren't. Now, back to the violence. Um, I think once Nick got more confrontational with the audience, then there was pushback in the other way. And I think that when we then arrived back in England, having recorded Prayers in Fire, uh, we got good reviews. We started to have people more like, you know, so you've got a club like the Moonlight Club holds about 400 people and it's packed. And so people are pushed right up against the front of the stage and it's hot and it's sweaty. So if Nick starts pushing back, they start pushing back. And that's where it all kind of came from. And then it became adversarial, adversarial and sort of like combative. You know, by the time we got to the junkyard stage, uh, oof, some of those shows got pretty crazy. So some of the ones in Europe got very, you know, I remember one particular one in Germany where they billed us as the hardest band from London. Like we were the toughest guys which we weren't, uh, but that, that's what the poster said in, in Cologne. And um, yeah, some guy came, was coming up out of the audience, had a freaking iron bar in his hand and, and was going to have a go at us. And uh, fortunately, you know, some, uh, a guy who traveled with us, who was kind of security, like grabbed this guy. And that's the same gig where the guy got up and pissed on stage and Tracy kicked him in the ass. Yeah. They talk about that in the 20,000 Days on Earth film. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, now you bring up Junkyard, that's where we're headed next. Uh, Junkyard is seen by many as the kind of peak album from the birthday party. I was wondering if you agree with that. I kind of I kind of think that Prayers on Fire, because it was such a departure from what we'd done previously, like it was really, I felt that was, you know, I don't think there's a massive jump from the kind of uh, what happened on Prayers on Fire to Junkyard, although there's some songs on there which are fantastic junkyard uh, uh, big jesus trash can is, is just awesome fun to play and um it's got this you know all those crazy kind of rollicking swing bits with me and tracy and stuff like that it's got yeah and i think um you know you really uh yeah yeah tracy he's um he's a big part of the sound of both of those records you know those bass lines and stuff even though nick wrote the bass line for uh, Yard and King Inc and Nick the Stripper and stuff like that. It's 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 the way Tracy hits it, you know, is is the, the kind of that, that loping sound of his is so great to as a drummer to just like get on that and you lock up with that and it's it's fantastic. Now Junkyard's a good record, but it was <sighs> things were getting um, yeah things things were getting a bit I think uh, starting to get a bit testy between Nick and Roland uh, a bit. Um, the junk was flowing quite a bit more. Um, and I think that made it, it certainly made it hard for me because I became a person on the outer um, because, you know, when people are uh, in that zone, if you're not in that zone with them, then uh, yeah, you're kind of, you're not in that zone. Uh, so yeah, and, and so some of that Mars, a bit of junk out. And also the fact that we didn't get it all finished in one session and then we had to, Tracy got put in jail and then we had to go back to England because we had touring commitments and then we had to blow off. We, we, we were supposed to do shows in uh, LA and San Francisco and they got cancelled because, you know, and then we had to pick up Barry Adamson to play bass. And so then, you know, and Harry played bass live on a few things and Barry played on uh, Kiss Me Black and Cupid Doll, which we then recorded in England, you know, because we were, um, yeah, it would, yeah, we were hemorrhaging Keith's money at this point in time too, because he was paying for all the recording. We had to finish the record. We had to get it out. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really do love some of the tracks on that. Uh, and I certainly enjoyed playing them and making them. But uh, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, like I said, I think Prayers on Fire was like more of a wow factor of change. And then Junkyard's kind of like, yeah, it's next level. But uh, I like, I actually, even though I don't play on it, I quite like... Um, the bad CDP, 
Um, uh, Mutiny, yeah, sort of. But the the bad CDP, I thought was was really that was that was a good progression from Junkyard and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, actually, the next section, bringing up Tracy, we're gonna we're gonna talk about him a little bit. I know you had shared a pretty entertaining story about how Dead Joe was recorded with Tracy in the studio. And I was just wondering if you could go over that again. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, well, yeah, we were, well, that's one of those kind of experimental kind of things. Well, I mean, the whole song's just in F, you know, it's just, there's just one note, but we wanted to get this, this kind of thing going. And so uh, we basically just tuned his E, his e string to F, uh, put some tape over the other three strings, lay the bass out on top of, uh, you know, some towels and stuff on top of a, it was a baffle in the studio. And then we played the, 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 the we played it with drumsticks. We played the E string with drumsticks. So, and that's, that's kind of how you get that, that really incredible smacking sound. The other thing too, um, a lot with Tracy's sound, he used um, stainless steel picks. And I think that added a lot to that, that kind of rasping edge on the, on the string and stuff like that. He also um, had a very particular way of EQing his amp. He, he, he used to suck all the mids out and just run, he'd run you know, the bottoms up really high and the tops up really high and pull big scoop out of the middle kind of thing. I think that really, and the, and the jazz bass I think also has a lot of that as well. Yeah, he, he, was, he was awesome. It was really, it was really uh, I'll never forget the day that uh, I heard that he died. It, because you know he and I went to school together and when when uh, what I finished school and stuff we, we moved out into an apartment together me and Tracy we you know for a share house and stuff which was that was a lot of beer and pizza you know but uh, yeah it, you know it's uh, it was very sad that uh, he passed away so young but uh, yeah and he uh, continued to do stuff after the birthday party as well. He was with the Saints for a while I know yeah he did he just did a tour with the, the actually he um he uh, went back to university. He was uh, studying literature, uh, and I think he wanted to write. Uh, and uh, he was less and less interested in being in the business. He did. Um, I think he did. He might have done a tour here with Nick after the after the birthday party was over. He might have done that man or myth tour that Nick did here, um, but yeah. No, I, I think he was really getting uh, out of it. He did, you know, he's in a, a, a Saints uh, uh, film clip for Ghost Ship playing um, double bass and stuff like that. And, you know, I, uh, but he, yeah, he did do tour, one tour with them. Uh, but I think he was kind of thinking more, I mean, last time I saw him where we really talked about it or anything like that, he was saying, I'm, you know, I'm sort of giving that one away. I've sold my bass and I'd really like to know where the bass went. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, I know you brought up uh, Barry Adamson earlier, and I know Tracy, obviously your partner in crime in the rhythm section there. What were those days like when you were playing with Barry Adamson? Well, that was that was really, really interesting because we knew Barry uh, already. And the funny thing is that Barry by this time was now married to Tracy's old girlfriend. This is this, so, so Tracy's girlfriend came to England to be with Tracy. And then while we were in Australia, away in Australia, I forget the year before or something like that. And then he broke up with Kate and he went out with another girl called Kate. But anyway, and then so Caitlin ended up um, uh, uh, dating Barry Adamson. And then they, they, they got married and had a kid. But uh, so Barry, it's weird. I love his bass playing. I was a big magazine fan. Uh, I, I loved his sound and his tone and everything like that. But it was like he wasn't even playing the parts properly. It, it was seriously, it felt so different to play with him. It was, it was kind of a struggle. It was kind of easier with Harry playing live because Harry was kind of really sticking to the parts and really concentrating. And I, I you know, I, you know, I was kind of like really trying to help Harry because he, you know, I mean, Barry had played, you know, hundreds of shows, you know, Harry was only fairly new to the bass guitar at this point in time. Uh, and good on him, you know, because he actually did a pretty good job. But, um, and, and, you know, so I spent a bit of time trying to help Harry with, you know, how, this is how it goes together with me. You know, this is where the beat goes, this is where it falls. But Barry knew it all. But when he played it, it, it just sounded kind of weird. I, it'd be interesting. I'd like to maybe hear a recording of one of those shows where he was playing. It probably exists somewhere, but, you know. Yeah, 
I'm amazed at the shit that exists out there these days. There's a pretty wide array of birthday party bootlegs out there. For I, I, I bet there is, and, and some of them might be, you know, anyway. <laughs> Now, uh, reading about the birthday party's first American tour, I've seen a, a lot of things saying that there were shows that weren't attended very well at all. They were small audiences. What was your experience coming uh, overseas this way? It was crazy because like we, we were pulling good crowds in uh, Europe and in England and stuff. And, uh, you know, that was our first foray into the United States. And we we're pretty excited about it all. Uh, and we had been booked into some, uh, the first show in New York, they pulled the plug on us after about two songs. Um, then, uh, I can't remember the sequence of, of the gigs, but then a gig got canceled because they'd heard that this, this other venue had canceled us because we were just too fucking outrageous or, you know, too much noise for anyone to bear, you know, not, you know, you, you're not, you're not going to want to see this. Um, then we did a gig at the Ritz with, uh, we were opening for the Au Pairs, I think. And um, I think we made it five songs in and then security um, basically lined the front of the stage and the venue pulled the power and, sent it and said, you can't play anymore. Um, but that then, the, you know, then the, 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 the you know, the, the word around that then spread. And so then I think we played the Peppermint Lounge uh anyway and we started to get crowds and by the time we got to the 9 30 club in washington we were yeah there was really people there and then we played a gig in chicago and it was you know really well attended um barney hoskins wrote a really great article about us being there and it was in the published in the NME. but that was probably by the time we he was there wrote the article about being there seeing the shows and stuff like that and uh yeah it, it was I, I just thought it was great to be in America, you know, so it was great to uh, be playing those, you know, we really, and we really wanted to get back, you know, there. I mean, the band did eventually go back, uh, the, the four-piece ladder version uh, did go back, and I think that they, they got to the West Coast and, and people were really digging them by then kind of thing, I think. But the profile in England had grown a lot more by then, and I think that trip to, um, that first trip to, to the East Coast had probably, you know, sent a few, you know, rumors through the you know the live scene that people would go oh well fuck i do want to see that kind of thing you know uh but uh yeah yeah there was some funny stories from from that tour that was um that was a uh, pretty interesting times tracy bought his first stetson uh in new york they took that great photo of him with the the the, the hat and the and the mesh t-shirt thing and he's you know that was in that uh, that nme article um yeah we'd it was a crazy story when we were coming back. Uh, we played this gig in Chicago. We flew out the next day. And the night before when we played, some people had chucked some pills on stage. And uh, Nick had picked some of them up. And we're on the plane going home. And so he decides he's going to, you know, take one of whatever it is. And uh, not, not even fucking knowing what it is. And we get to Heathrow and he's smashed, you know. Uh, so he's, um, uh, we, we're getting, you know, he can barely walk doesn't know where he's going and uh, so I got the guitars and put them on the luggage trolley and I said you hang on to the side of the trolley walk next to me and we're just going to walk straight out of here just look straight ahead nothing's going to happen and we were walking out and the customs guys just saw Nick and that he was not moving well and also he stands out quite a bit and they said hey you over here and who's with you that's all you guys and they yeah they pulled everything apart, but there was not there was nothing to find. You know his internal possession at this time. Well, poor oh, poor Mick Harvey got strip shirt searched. <laughs> the school yeah, no, not him. Like you want to, somebody strip search someone else. It's not going to be Mick, you idiot. <laughs> and, poor Mick. Yeah. Uh, no, <clears throat> I've read. Uh, debate that there was a stop in toronto canada on the birthday party tour is that is that true no okay see that's what was there not, not on that not on that tour not on that tour maybe on the next one when it when it was when you know the, they were doing the uh, uh the bad c uh yeah the bad cdp when they went over and did that maybe there was toronto on that i'm not sure but no we're not not on the tour the last there, there was maybe because we Chicago wasn't on the original dates on that tour. It got added because there was, you know, they were going, uh, 
they were going, oh man, you know, I heard these guys are going crazy in New York, you know, fuck, you know, let's get them up here. So we went up there, you know. Now, you brought up uh, a show getting shut down real early in New York. I actually yeah. wanted to go into a deep dive on that and see if I could bring up any any memories. And if this is the one that you were talking about, I have an article here. I'm just going to read to you briefly uh, by Helena Glass, if that rings a bell. I know, I know Helena Glass. That's Kate's Glass wife. Where did she write this article? Okay. Uh, okay. This is about... Um, Okay, here we go. Nick Cave had invited Iggy Pop to the gig, gig and he actually came. September 1981, The Underground, New York City, as documented. The concert starts around midnight at the upmarket rock disco. The audience consists of the disco's clientele and eight fans from Chicago. Mick Harvey, who's screaming drunk, shouts insults at the audience, which does not want the band to be there. During the 15-minute version of King Inc., Nick walks into the audience, wraps the mic lead around the throat of a woman, and screams, express yourself. The 10 remaining people start leaving the concerts and stop by the management of the club. Yep, there you go. Uh, doesn't, doesn't mention the, uh, uh, this, this was, uh, what, what was the date on that gig? It was... Uh, October, was it? September 23rd, 81. There you go. So that's one day after Nick's birthday. Uh, and uh, for his birthday, I had had a, a, I had a tailor in London make him a pair of gold lame trousers. Yeah. And uh, at, uh, by, I think by gig four in America, they were totally shredded. But at that underground gig, there's pictures of him at the Ritz wearing those pants. And so that, that was my, my birthday present to him. So he would have been, yeah, 23 or 24 or something like that. So yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's but that's what, that's what those shows were like. <laughs> and yeah, and that was, that was you going, who booked us in here? And it was crazy because um, uh, I'm wondering if I, Ruth Polsky, who ran the dance at Tyria, I think she had something to do with with, she liked bringing in these English bands, you know, kind of thing into New York. And I think uh, that she was maybe responsible for getting some of those dates. And that's why, you know, because you wouldn't come unless you had, you know, five or six or seven shows because, you know, you've got to make enough money to cover the airfares and all that kind of shit, you know. But yeah, no, that's, um, that's probably a fairly re um, accurate representation of that evening. Whether Mick was really drunk, Mick, very, uh, very unlikely that very unusual I should say that Mick Harvey is drunk on stage uh maybe a beer before the show maybe a vodka tonic maybe that's it he's not a big boozer uh I'd say he more likely it was late had jet lag had a drink or two and it was had really done his head and also was possibly angry about being in the completely wrong place for our band um but yeah, I do remember he was not well. I think he, I think he um, uh, threw up after or before the show anyway. But um, uh, so I, I, I wouldn't say that he was, yeah, because it's really out of character. I've never seen Mick get pissed on stage. And yeah, likewise, um, in the whole time I played in, in the birthday party, um, uh, Roland was never stoned on stage, never. Afterwards, well, yes, you know, the day before, the day after, whatever. Yeah, sure. But on the day he's going to play and when he plays, uh -uh, you know, not till afterwards. You know, so that was, you know, that's, you know, for somebody who's, you know, possibly even jonesing for it a bit, you know, it's, uh, it showed at least that the music was very important. And I know Nick was a little more hit or miss as a... Um, no, oh, yeah, Nick, Nick more likely, the, the worst thing that could happen to Nick would be that, Marky e. Smith would turn up at soundcheck and then by the time we got to the show Nick had been drinking in the pub with him for four hours or something you know Nick I, um no I never uh Nick not smacked on stage no not back then um I I would never have seen that um no but um uh and Tracy uh Tracy possibly quite drunk uh but only in I only really saw him kind of lose it and, you know, like fluff and mess up his parts as a result of drinking maybe once or twice. And, you know, I did 400 shows with that band kind of thing, you know, so yeah, there, there was a, there was a level of professionalism and, and you got to get into the, the fact that the, uh, 
you know, the legend starts to grow to, you know, ridiculous proportions after a while. And, you know, you know, the you know, theory, you know, they, everyone's got Tracy dry, dying of a fucking drug overdose, which he didn't. You know, everyone's, you know, like everyone assumes that I took smack, which I never did, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's like, oh, you know, birthday party, you know, fuck, you know, you must have hep C. And I go, no, I don't, you know. I, don't use no, I wondered about that myself because Mick had kind of said that that was Nick and Roland's kind of scene. Mm. And, uh, I know um, Nick had said in the interview famously that he wasn't a pot smoker. And yeah. I was wondering if maybe for the rest of you, maybe something a little lighter like pot was uh, going around. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, certainly it's, you know, school and things like that. We smoked open and then I suppose, um, uh, the other one too is, I mean, I do remember Nick uh, being in London and they couldn't get any gear. And so they, you know, be with someone else. And, and it was like, there was this real derision about, oh, well, I suppose we could just go and get potted, you know, sort of thing. Like, it's like, you know, but of course you can get, you can get hash in England that will absolutely kill you, you know, <laughs> like, you'll, you'll be wiped on that stuff. So, um, yeah, look, there was, look, you know, I, I smoked a bit of dope. Tracy smoked a bit of dope. Um, uh, Really, amphetamines became the thing. Yeah, you know, the, the 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 more prevalent drug use was speed, really. Yeah. You know, and it became initially it was speed to be in the studio and speed to you know drive overnight to Sydney and stuff like that. You know, we we did gigs where you know we we did two shows in a night in Melbourne and then we bounced bumped out of the second show, jumped in a car and drove twelve hours to Sydney and had a show a day and a half later kind of thing you know it's like that that's the kind of crazy things they do on the road here yeah you know, or did back then you know so yeah speed uh, <laughs> that uh that show in new york that iggy pop showed up for did you have any conversations with iggy pop um no i i did later um later in my life i've had quite a few um uh, long conversations with iggy but um Iggy, I don't recall Iggy being at a show. I recall that Iggy was staying at the Iroquois and so were we, and that he was drinking in the front bar of the Iroquois. I think Nick might have gone and spoken to him. I don't actually remember on that tour Iggy coming to a show. And I think I would, I think I would have remembered that. So maybe on the subsequent tour, when I wasn't there, they they got they got together or you know saw Iggy or whatever like that. I, I met Iggy when I was in the psychedelic furs, and we had a uh, yeah a few times because he was friends with the furs guys as well. They'd um, supported him on a tour in the UK, and then yeah they'd always you know yeah so and we'd stay at the Gramercy Park and and Iggy would be hanging around and yeah it was we'd go drinking bars down on, on Third Avenue and stuff in the Irish pubs and stuff yeah. Now, what year would that have been when you met Iggy? That's in the first, well, that's 82, 83. So that's late 82, first half of 83. Okay, so, so that would have been around his zombie birdhouse. Uh, yeah, it was just, uh, might have been that. He was, um, the first time he'd just done uh, the TV show with Letterman uh, or was it Letterman? It was one of those Tonight Shows anyway, uh, where uh, he played on TV with he, with um, Bowie. And he, I think he'd just done that. Or maybe I've got the wrong thing. Anyway, uh, he'd, just, he'd done a TV appearance um, on one of those late night shows. And then he came back to the hotel and then we all got went out. And, and then I got in terrible, terrible um, trouble with the psychedelic furs guys. Oh man, Jesus, you're just sucking up to Iggy all night. You love him talking about, you ask him about all his records and you want to know about Funhouse and you want to know about, you know, Scott Ashton. And I said, fuck, you know, we're, we're cool too. I'm going, not that cool. <laughs> no, I agree. Iggy's the man. <laughs> absolutely. That's Still. That, that's absolutely hilarious. So actually on, Nick Cave's conversations tour, I asked him about Iggy Pop. That's a, I'm a huge fan, huge fan. Oh yeah, oh Nick, absolutely. And it's really funny, I remember, I remember one of the, the best things, and I think, I don't know if it was, uh, uh, it was one of those like, you know, 20 question things in a magazine and something like that. And they're asking Iggy Pop, I said, oh, you know, 
who would you most like to sit next to on an airplane? He goes, Nick Cave, I reckon that'd be fun, you know, kind of thing. But I think that was before they had actually like, you know, because they ended up doing, um, there's a thing out here, which was called the Big Day Out, which is kind of like Lollapalooza. It's like a, a touring yeah. thing. And uh, Iggy and the Bad Seeds were on this, this, this tour thing one year. There's loads of photos of them all hanging out backstage. And yeah, I think, I think Mud Honey were on it as well and stuff like that, so yeah. <laughs> All right, I wanted to ask you about uh, when Lydia Lunch started coming around, what did you make of her and the Teenage Jesus and the Jerks? Well, I'd, I'd heard the records prior. I was a big fan of her record that she did, uh, Queen of Siam, where she uh, got the, that like Hollywood orchestra to do all that stuff with her. I, I thought that record was just fucking, I, I still reckon that's probably the best record she's ever done, which she would not agree with. Uh, Lydia was fine. Uh, she was always very kind and polite to me. Um, uh, she was fine to have on the road. Um, you know, the, 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 there was more kind of tension and stuff going on between, you know, her and Roland and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, there was, you know, definitely something going on there with those guys. Uh, you know, and what happens on the road stays on the road and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, no, I, I didn't. I didn't particularly like um, the stuff she was doing with Roland. When they, they they did an opening set before the birthday party on this tour of Europe that we did, and it was you know Lydia and Roland would like do this kind of you know this where she was almost yeah. I mean there were songs that they had constructed, but I wasn't really a, a fan of what they were doing kind of thing. Uh, but I did like some of the teenage Jesus and the Jerk stuff. Uh, you know the various players in that that you know that band were all good you know and uh whatnot but uh yeah she's you know she's fine i still you know occasionally see her when she comes out here and stuff like that but oh she oh she um no she um she came to uh when the first played at the santa monica civic center she turned up backstage with the uh, exine savenka and uh, they gave me a copy of uh, the book that they did together Adulterers Anonymous, and they both signed and gave it, you know, me. So I've still got that somewhere. So that was nice, you know. So yeah, she's a nice girl. Uh, I know you didn't play on it, but I was wondering if uh, you remember any conversation within the band about the honeymoon and red sessions. No. Uh, so it, this is the is this the uh, D Houter, the backing band, and Nick singing? Is that that, or is this? No, the... no, that was the Burn and Ice album. But no, that was the Lydia Lunch, um, Tracy Pugh, Roland S. Howard, and then Nick and Mick did a couple songs on it. They wanted out of it, and she credited them as um, Junkie Cowboy and Dick Strum. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah of course, yeah. Um, uh, can't say that one spends a lot of time on my turntable. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever listened to the record. Uh, yeah. You know, I know it's one that uh, Nick is not a fan of, but I have to say Tracy is an animal on that album. Oh, yeah. Well, I can see uh, from the background that you're a bass player. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, and you got some. Hey, I'll tell you what. Oh, oh yeah. All good. Just done. one second. I've got an idea. I didn't want you to drink it on your own, man. There you go. A beer always helps. <laughs> Five. Been playing it dangerous, eh? Drinking Corona this day and age. <laughs> I know. It's really funny. I did hear that initially in America, the sales dropped massively because it was called Corona, which is, you're going, really? Anyway, pretty funny. All right, um, we left off with uh, Lydia. I was wondering if you uh, could talk about the first time you saw Einsterzen Neubauten. I, I probably botched the pronunciation. Well, Einsterzen de Neubauten, yeah. Um, my first time I saw them was uh, in London uh, and they were playing at a place called the Acklam Hall, uh, which was a, a place that had been made famous where The Clash had done quite a few of their early gigs. And... Uh, yeah, they were, uh, my God, they were incredible. They had power tools on stage and they had giant metal drums and the percussion guy looked like a freaking oiled up wrestler. And uh, yeah, they were, and Blixer was, uh, the first time I ever met Blixer was, we were touring in Germany 
And uh, we arrived at the venue where we were playing out in our crappy van with all our crappy equipment and started loading in and everything like that. And there's this guy in the band room, he's just sitting there and he's got like a rubber raincoat on uh, and the, he's got like a belt around it, but the belt is actually the safety belt that he's stolen off a Lufthansa aeroplane. And then he's got, you know, point toe boots and all his hair and all this kind of stuff. But he had a sleeping mask on, like he was just there, like catching some, you know, some sleep waiting for us to, and then once he just introduced himself and uh, uh, said, you, you know, you guys are great and my band's really great too and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And then, yeah, the, 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 the first time I saw them, them play was, yeah, was uh, in, uh, in London. And yeah, they were, it was jaw dropping really, you know, it was, uh, yeah, I, I suppose, if you listen to a lot of kind of kraut rock, you can kind of see they just kind of the, you know, the birthday party version of Can or something like that kind of thing, you know, something like that, you know, like Can are great, don't get me wrong. I, I, yeah. But yeah, I mean, they were, I think they were a logical progression of, of, of you know, that, that kind of Germanic sound. Do you have a, uh... Any standout memories of the John Peel sessions at all? Yeah, um, it was really, um, the first one we did was only eight track. Uh, I think maybe the first two we did were only eight track. And there was a small studio uh, just across the road from, uh, so, so the, the BBC have got a whole lot of studios in London and they've got really big ones that made avail where they also, where they do orchestras and all kinds of stuff, but they've got some smaller ones right in the middle of town near where they broadcast from, from where John Peel used to do his, his show from where the studios were. There was, and that's the first one or two Peel sessions we did there. And then the third one I did with, with um, the band was at Maida Vale and I didn't, I'm not on the fourth one. Uh, but the, the thing that I, that was, was fantastic was that there was a guy, uh, called Dale Griffin, uh, was, uh, producing the session and he's the drummer from Mop the Hoople. So this guy was like someone I, I, you know, I had pictures of him on the back of albums and stuff like that. And he was the drummer and, uh, and he was, um, yeah, he was really nice and kind and sympathetic. They, and you've also, you got you've got like six hours or something like that to record and mix four songs. So, you know, you've got to be ready when you get there and, and you know, and they're, they're even, I think they're pretty much counting the setup time as well. So, you know, you're, you're really going fast. Uh, but we were so used to working with 24 track. I was just amazed. Um, you know, if you know what you're doing, how uh, people can get so much, you know, onto eight tracks. Of course, when you realize what people used to get onto four was pretty amazing as well. And when you listen to Spectre, where you only had three and then ended up with mono one, you know, it's like, it's a, uh, and so it's something I, I study a lot. I do a lot of engineering and I produce records and shit like that. So I, I yeah, anyway, uh, great old English desks uh, and um, craziest thing as all, the faders, which were those kind of lumpy ones that you see on Beatles consoles and things like that. Um, they get louder as you pull them towards you. So the, it's the opposite direction. Yeah, it's, like loud. yeah it's, not, it's not loud that way, it's loud this way. You push it up, it, it gets quieter. And if you're trying to help with the mix, this is not, you know, you just turned it down, you know? But uh, yeah, that, and, and there was a cool little um, space. And, uh, and yeah, we worked really fast. I, I, like, I like all of those. Um, uh, oh, there was, there's a really dumb song we did on the second one. Uh, what was it called? Balled around in that stuff, which we never, which never made it to a real record because it was a pretty shit song. But anyway, yeah. Now it got in. I think so. I did that get included with the Drunk on a Pope's Blood EP split with uh, Lydia Lunch? Mm, no, no, I don't think so. Um, I can go grab that. I can't. I can't. I. I actually can't remember the track listing on that. I do like the the whole concept of being drunk on the Pope's blood uh, and then making up all these bullshit stories that it was actually a, a gin cocktail and all this kind of stuff, whereas really we're just trying to 
say something, you know, uh, that was slightly offensive and get away with it. Uh, and I also liked uh, that, um, you know, what I, what I think it says on the album cover, it says like 15 minutes of sheer hell. And, uh, you know, I, we, we used to like that kind of stuff. It was like things from, you know, B-grade movies or from, you know, trash detective novels. And those, those kind of like great, you know, lines of, you know, she was all bad, but, you know, he couldn't resist her and, you know, all that kind of thing. Uh, you know, um, there was a, a very famous uh, 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 club in Melbourne. It was a, a strip joint, you know, and uh, and they used to have, they had strippers, but they also had like a lot of uh, female impersonated shows and like that. And they had this giant sign out the front that said, this is the show. And the first letter of each word was giant, and then the rest of the word was really small. So basically, it was just this giant sign on the outside of a pub that said tits. But you know, like they they couldn't make them take it down, you know, because it actually said this is the show, you know. But basically, it just said tits. <laughs> so things like that. That's the thing. A lot of people don't get. Like the birthday party was really funny. We we laughed a lot. We we played a lot of pranks on each other. We were a bunch of fucking badass schoolboys. Um, that had known each other for a long time. So we knew what turned people's key in their back and wound them up, you know, and um, yeah. And, you know, we traveled in vans and, you know, we used to rehearse songs sometimes with our mouths in the van while, you know, like, or, or, you know, or me beating on seat and Tracy, boom, 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 boom. like, yeah, it's like, and you'd be laughing like crazy or, or we'd be driving along and Nick would start singing, Black Betty, or he'd start singing. Uh, but you know, when he was singing Black Betty, then he wasn't doing, you know, the, you know, he's doing the Ram Jam Band version, you know, like the that that's the one we knew from kids. We have, hadn't got to the John Lee Hooker or whoever it was, Hardy Led Better or whoever whoever it was. Um, and you know, I remember driving. We we're I think in Scotland or something like that, and Nick starts singing like you know, um, "Take It to the Limit" by the Eagles, kind of thing, you know. And then, you know, we were on an aeroplane one time going to Tasmania or something and Nick made a puppet out of the sick bag, like a little rabbit and put a face on it. And there was a kid over the seat in front of me doing a puppet show for the kid, you know, like it was fun. You know, we, we it wasn't all, oh, I'm so gothic. You know, I, I hated being called goth. I didn't like, I didn't identify with those bands like, you know, Bauhaus and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, we, you know, yeah, I mean, there was a dark side to the music, but there was also an irreverence, you know, we weren't, we weren't all, you know, standing around being moody in long coats, you know. So what do you think about the uh, subgenring of uh, the post-punk label? Um, <clears throat> yeah, in as much as what, I mean, there's so many versions, you know, like there was punk, then there was, then there was punk, you know, all over again, and you had you know, the exploited, and then the, then you've got, you know, that American band that sounded like The Clash, and, the, you know, and you sort of go, what, what it, you know, it just keeps going around in circles. I mean, what, what you mean, that the, the birthday party is called post-punk? Is that what you're kind of asking me, that, that the birthday party is classified as being post-punk? Is that... Yeah, they're kind of seen, I think, them and Joy Division are the two kind of seen as the biggest bands but I know one thing that Nick had said on the topic was that there's a lot of shoegazy vibes to the other post-punk bands that was completely absent from the birthday party music oh yeah yeah uh, um yeah I mean we yeah we we were we were we were facing the audience we weren't looking at our shoes no I mean I know what you mean yeah there wasn't there wasn't you know you, you haven't got Roland's guitar you know draped in freaking you know, chorus and flange and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's a much more, you know, direct, aggressive kind of sound. And uh, uh, no, I yeah. believe I read. I don't know if I'm wrong, and you know, correct me. That Roland set up for guitar with two pedals, and they were uh, what the Blue Box, MXR, and MXR Distortion, right? Yeah, that's it. Both of those, like his famous Fender Jaguar, he never paid for. Um, and uh, uh, the Distortion Plus was stolen from a band called La Femme, and the Blue Box was stolen from a guy called Eric Gradman, who played violin through it, but um, by our road crew, who were very good thieves. Uh, and 
And he, Roland used to play a uh, Ibanez copy of um, uh, a Firebird because he was really, he really, uh, he really loved Phil Manzanera uh, from uh, Roxy Music, and he played Firebirds. Uh, and then uh, Keith, he, he found that Jag, and he really wanted it. And Keith said, "Okay, I'll buy it for you, but you've got to pay me back five bucks a week." <laughs> and I, yeah, I think Keith might have got three installments, you know, kind of thing. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have to say, with uh, Tracy was uh, playing a Rickenbacker at one stage, and then he sold that. And uh, yeah, he needed more money to to get the jazz, and uh, Keith fronted for the difference between the Rickenbacker and the jazz and stuff. So, you know. I paid for all my own drums, by the way. <laughs> now, that was the next question. And while we're talking about gear, what was your kit of choice throughout the birthday party and Boys Next Door years? Okay, Boys Next Door, um, I had a, um, well, the very first kit I had was a, a very shoddy old English kit uh, called Auto Crap made by uh, John Gray and Sons. And I had that from about 14 until I was 16. And then I sold that and I bought a, uh, it was a wood fiberglass pearl kit. Uh, it was, I couldn't afford like high end gear. I couldn't be buying no American drums. And uh, they were, we, American drums were very expensive and very rare in Australia. Uh, There's a lot of Japanese drums there basically because uh, the, the music companies there could import them and, and they would land at a reasonable price. So <clears throat> that kit got used on, uh, pretty much all the hee-haw stuff. Uh, it, I used studio kits on uh, the um, uh, second side of Door Door, which is Shivers and I Mistake Myself. And all that. it's all, that's all my symbols, but the, the drum kit's a Sonal kit that was in that studio. But my, my drum kit of choice uh, in the birthday party was a very large premiere kit. Uh, and I played that, that's, that's on that's all on prayers on fire. So all the Zoo Music Girl, you know, King Inc, all that, uh, all that Tom Tom stuff, Dead Song and everything like that is massive, goddamn four piece kit, but just really huge drums. 14 by 14 rack Tom, it was massive, you know. Um, after uh, that, from that kit, when, when I, um, I sold that kit to a guy in another band because I thought I was moving back to Australia. And that's when, at that point in time, I got rung up by the Furs and they asked me to join. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll jam with you while, you know, while you audition other drummers, you know, but I'm going back to Australia. And then I rehearsed with them for about two weeks. And then they said, look, you know, do you want to do this? And I said, yeah, okay. And so I did that. And so from there on, I've always played Ludwig. So since 1982, I've played almost exclusively Ludwig and I, I collect them as well. So I've got... I've got uh, two 1962 pre-serial number kits. Uh, I've got a 70s stainless steel kit, which is so loud. Uh, and then I've got about eight snares. I did have some Gretsch snares, but I sold those and uh, all my snares are Ludwig. And I've got a uh, highly collectible uh, 1927 Black Beauty. It's like, uh, yeah, nearly, nearly 100 years old. And it sounds fucking awesome. Nice, nice. Now, being, uh, I'm going to skip ahead and come back here. Being in the record business, what do you think of the evolution of the electronic drum kit? Uh, I think they're great um, to be able to live in a, an apartment and uh, practice you know, as much as you like without driving the neighbors crazy. Um, I certainly wouldn't use one to record, um, although I might use one. Some like I might use like a, a you know a, a drum pad or a trigger thing or something like that to trigger a particular sound. I was playing uh, for a, a girl singer for a, a couple of years here, and uh, you know I did a record with her. And then when we were playing live, uh, I'd done a whole lot of like you know percussion stuff and glockenspiel and, and stuff like that on her record. And so when we we're trying to emulate that, I was using one of those Roland SB D DX kind of pad things. Um, live uh, just to trigger sounds and things but yeah um look they've, they've got their place uh i think it's more interesting when you fuck with that stuff rather than trying to make them sound like real drums mm -hmm. but real drums do real drums uh if you want to use electric stuff and then you want to really you know mess around with the sounds then that can be a lot of fun too you know so 
Uh, I'm not adverse. It's, it's not really the kind of music I do that much of. I, I tend to play uh, with people who want a drummer. You know, like, you know, people send me stuff from overseas and go, will you play drums on this? And if I like it, I say, yeah, okay. They send me the track, I'd send them back to Maltese, you know, they mix it, whatever. Yeah, they, they work for the residents, not a garage band. <laughs> yeah. All right, now uh, I wanted to ask you, wrapping up the, the birthday party realm of the questions, what did that last show look like for you? Um, you know, it was, it was really, it was pretty tough. Um, you know, I was probably, you know, pretty all over the place with the whole situation, you know, emotionally, uh, because, you know, this is, this, you know, I went to school with these guys, you know, it, it would be like you all had matching leather jackets with, you know, a gang name on the back of it kind of thing, you know, it would be, it was like that, you know, we, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd lived in each other's pockets and, and been, you know, friends for years. And so it was, uh, for me, it was quite a harsh uh, decision. Uh, um, yeah, poor old Mick Harvey was the guy who had to, you know, give me the give me the, the bullet kind of thing. We were we'd done a TV show in Holland where we'd mimed, but they'd done uh, we had a backing track with no vocal on it. Nick had sung, and so they record that and they send you back into the studio. Yeah, when you just put that live, so he's got perfect lip sync when you do that because it's actually he's sung it right. So uh, we just went to the studio just to mix this onto this track to send back to these cats in Holland. And uh, we took a Siggy break and you know, went outside. And uh, there'd been all this talk that we were going to relocate to Berlin. And I was going, look, yeah, Berlin's fine. I love it there. But, you know, I'm really settled here. And, you know, I'll just, you know, whenever we're going to rehearse or whenever, you know, we're going to play or tour a gig or we're going to do a record, I'll just come over on the train and I'll stay for a few weeks and do all of that. And then because it was getting like that anyway, you know, uh, we weren't all living in the same house anymore. We had friends in England. You know, we, we, we'd carved out a piece of world there, at least I had. And, um, and then, you know, Mick said, uh, oh, well, you know, the band's decided they're, they're you know, we're going to go to Berlin. And I said, oh, well, you know, that's fair enough. But, you know, I've told you, I'll, I'll just work. And he goes, no, 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 you don't understand. He said, the band's going to Berlin and you're not coming. And I went, and that's, that was it. That was it. And then we had some gigs booked and um, I think we might have, we might have even done some shows I'd have to look it up. I can't remember. But yeah, then there was just going to be this one last show uh, at the venue uh, in, in Victoria, in London. And uh, the whole idea was we were going to sell it out, which we knew we could do. And um, we were just going to split it for um, five ways. Everyone, you know, they'd take that money to be part of their stake to set them up to, to go to Berlin. I'd take the money uh, to basically get myself where I wanted to go back to Australia or whatever. Uh, and the funny thing that night after the show in the band room, um, Richard and Tim Butler from the Furs were in the, in the band room and John Ashton from the Furs were there as well. So they knew I was out of the band. Uh, and I think they had just found out that their drummer, uh, Vince Seeley, had quit. So they, and they, they had an album they'd just finished with Todd Rundgren and they were due to go out on the road in the States in September. So in late September. So it was like, yeah. So it, it all happened pretty quick. But um, uh yeah, Richard always tells me, yeah, um, you know, Nick butted out his cigarette in my beer. <laughs> yeah, Nick, Nick, I don't think Nick was much of a psychedelic first hand. I remember early on, Roland really liked them. But uh, yeah, that was, uh, it was, look, it was, a, it was a tough night. Uh, we played great. Um, I've, people tell me stories about it now. Oh, um, you know, Barry Adamson got up and played drums on a song or something. I'm like, I don't remember that. But then, you know, I'm getting old now, man. It's, it's fucking 40 years ago, you know, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, keeping sharp, keeping sharp enough. <laughs> uh, now, all right, going into the psychedelic first stuff, I imagine that those tours looked vastly different from what the Ooh, birthday party tours poor were. Old, poor old birthday party guys. They're in their little Dodge Ram van. You know, right. driving across the United States with their guitars in the back, pick up back line everywhere, you know, some tour manager driving the bus. No, 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 it was, yeah, it was full on. We had, we had a bus for the crew. We had a full bus for the band, you know, the whole 
floating lounge room with the fridge and the bunk beds and the two lounge rooms and all that stuff. You know, how many times did we watch This Is Spinal Tap and the Blues Brothers? I don't know, you know, it's like, we had, yeah. And uh, it was kind of like that. It was, uh, uh, you know, we played, we, we stayed in nice hotels. Well, you know, not fan, you know, occasionally we get a really cool hotel, but you know, the worst it got was a holiday inn. So, you know, it was, there was no Motel 6 kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, we, it was great. I mean, we played, the band was actually not that good um, at the beginning of the tour because we just weren't rehearsed up enough. And we picked up uh, a sax player and a girl playing cello because that song, uh, that album Forever Now had a whole lot of strings and stuff on it. And we wanted to replicate that live. Um, they just, they'd taken on this uh, keyboard player guy called Ed Buller, who went on to be really great and good record producer, still a good mate of mine. Um, and uh, so the band wasn't that kind of together because it was really just reforming after having, you know, they, they'd previously got rid of their second guitarist and saxophone player. And then after making the record with Todd Rundgren, the drummer had quit because he only ever wanted to work with Todd Rundgren. And so he, you know, he, he was happy about that. And he just quit. So, um, yeah, but by the time we got maybe 10, 15 shows in, it was really quite a unit, you know, and it was, it was going good. And we came out to Australia. Well, we played a fe big festival in New Zealand. We came out to Australia just to do six shows or something like that. And then we were able to, because um, here there's, there's kind of two levels of playing. There's playing, you know, theatres and kind of like places that hold, you know, two to 4,000 kind of halls. And then there's what they call the pub scene, but there's some quite big pubs. They'll hold 1,500 to 2,000 people. So then we did a whole other lap up and down the uh, the east coast of Australia playing like about another 15, 20 shows in Australia before we went back to the States. And then we did another, we did, 100 and, we did 130 shows in five countries in six and a half months with the first. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we're working. But um, it was one of these things where I really was um, trying to bring a bit of the birthday party to the psychedelic furs. And they were really trying to, which is kind of they were a bit more from that world earlier on. And then they they just seemed to be heading like for the disco and for the dance floor and stuff like that. And and for the 80s giant gated reverb stair seemed to be the next thing for them. And um, and that's where they went. And that's why they got Keith Forsey as a producer, because he'd done all that shit with Billy Idol and he'd done that stuff with Simple Minds and everything like that. And so uh yeah and i i kind of locked horns with him uh because he wanted to do it all with program drums with uh, you know um a lindrum and uh, i said fuck i'm gonna play on the record i don't know what you think you're doing i'm playing on the record and uh uh and i wasn't that keen on click tracks um i'm better at them now but i i, I like things to ebb and flow I don't think, I don't care if it accelerates into a chorus. I think it sounds great. It sounds like excitement. As long as you can get it back down for the verse, it's, it's great. You don't want the whole song to speed up through the whole history of the song, you know, but if you can get that thing where you feel the excitement, the chorus is coming, here it comes, you know, but uh, yeah. So then uh, I was, uh, it was all done. The studio time was booked. Uh, we'd rehearsed up. We had about eight or 10 songs. We probably needed a few more, but the first said, oh, no, we'll just write them in the studio, which was something that the birthday party, I think, wrote one song in the studio in their entire life. We usually had it going on kind of thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I flew to, I flew to New York. Uh, I was on the plane with Ed. We're sitting together. Uh, by that, at this stage, uh, Richard and Tim were living in New York. We're flying to New York, but then the session uh, was in L.A. Uh, and... I'd gone a bit early because we were going to hang out in New York, catch up with some friends there and then go across. And Ed was on the plane with me all the way to New York and he already knew I was out of the band. And uh, so what had happened was after one of the last rehearsals, Keith Forsey got together with uh, Richard and Tim, who are the brothers and who control everything, and basically said, yeah, I don't, you know, we don't need that drummer. Said you, they, they said, you can get a better drummer than that. He said, and besides, I don't want him on this record. And uh, they, they went with the record producer. John Ashton, the guitarist, was absolutely against it. Uh, and Ed probably didn't have voting rights. I was considered a member of the band at that point in time. 
uh, although I wasn't listed on the deal with CBS and I wasn't listed on the publishing contract. But, you know, as far as it went, you know, the whole of that previous tour, the four people were the members of the band, the other people were side men, you know. But from there on in, uh, the Furs were only ever those three guys and everybody else was was basically a hide gun. Uh, but, yeah, so then, I mean, I'm staying with a friend, Marcy Weber, and she worked for um, William Morris Agency, and uh, she... Staying at her apartment, I get a phone call from Les Mills, the first manager, Phil. Yes, Les, what? Oh, um, look, there was a meeting uh, uh, with Keith and, and the, the other guys and everything like that, and uh, you're out of the band. And I went, I seriously thought this was like someone pulling my leg. I thought it was a fucking joke, right? And so I said, yeah, what, Les, what, you know, what do you need? Do you need to speak to Ed or why are you calling? You know, he said, no, 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 no. Keith and Richard and Tim have, uh, and say, and then, then you're not playing on the record. And, and uh, so I've just been told to find out what you want and, and, um, and then we're going to work it out. And I said, really? I said, um, call me back in an hour. So then I went downstairs and I bought a bottle of vodka. <laughs> And I poured myself a couple of stiff drinks and then I thought about it and I made some calls. And then he came back and he said, what do you want? I said, I said, I want a plane ticket from here to London. I want a plane ticket from London to Australia and I want a thousand US dollars. Uh, and he said, you can have one of the plane tickets and I'll give you the grant. And so I took the most expensive plane ticket, which was New York to Australia and, uh, and said, there you go. And then that was the end of that one. But don't worry, uh, you know, I've been kicked out of better bands than that. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next one, that you finished off the 80s with a five-album run with a band, Blue Ruin. Now, I was unfamiliar with them, I must admit, before looking into this before the podcast with you. I was wondering, five albums, what are some standout moments from that time period? The first record's really um, fantastic, um, and we did it in two days. Um, uh, we recorded it in two days and then mixed it in another two or three. But anyway, uh, and it was great because it was back working with Tony. And what had happened was they they tricked me, those guys. So um, I knew I knew these guys because they used to come to our shows. And then um, I was back in Australia, and I'd been doing some session stuff uh, at a recording studio. And I was actually I was driving a taxi cab for a living. Um, because, and, uh, so, uh, these guys, uh, the singer said, rang me up, this guy, Quincy, who I know, and he goes, um, oh man, he said, um, and I'd seen their band play my, my, my friend, uh, oh, they know, you don't know who that is, but anyway, uh, had taken me to see them. I said, yeah, they're pretty good. Fuck me. You know, they're obviously like, you know, coming a little bit from where we came from and stuff like that. And, uh, he goes, um. So the singer rings me up and goes, look, we've got this gig. We're launching this single. And I'm really, there's been a lot of arguments. I think the drummer's going to quit. And I'm, I'm booked. You know, we've got this thing. I've got posters up around town and we've made the records and everything like that. If this guy pulls the pin, you know, will you sit in? And I said, oh, fuck, yeah. If, you know, if it goes down, you, I'll help you out of a jam, sure. And so then he rings me back two days later. He goes, the drummer quit. <laughs> Of course, the drummer didn't quit. They, f they fucking sacked the drummer so that I would play with them. And so then, then I learned, I played the show and everything. And uh, we, we um, and yeah, and it was fun. And I knew, I knew the bass player from, from years ago. He'd been, uh, Adam, he'd been around the scene for ages. And, and uh, yeah, and it was kind of fun. It was easy. And it was in, in Melbourne. Uh, oh, no. Okay. Gotcha. The Blue Room was, uh, it was great. Um, we made, um, but we, we made a second record after the first one, which was uh, much more highly uh, produced, uh, a slightly slicker kind of vibe to it. Um, but uh, the band wrote incredibly slowly. Um, but, uh, at, you know, hey, I'm just a drummer, so, you know, I should have just, I suppose written some songs and shut the fuck up, but no, I mean it was um uh, they the, the material just didn't come fast enough. I was used to you know having you know people with almost too much material to deal with and 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 things always changing and stuff. But you know um, 
anyway, it, it kind of ran its course. We went, we moved to England. Um, uh, we we demoed for Geffen. We nearly got signed uh, to Geffen. Uh, Atlantic in in uh, the UK wanted to sign us, um, but then the Geffen thing. It was like it was like we we were in the, the middle of that machine where people can't make up their mind what to do with you, but they kind of think they want you and stuff. Uh, then we had a situation where Geffen wanted to sign. Was it? But they said you've got to have. It was either Geffen or Atlantic, and they said you've got to have management. And so they put us in touch with some like you know business, real business head type managers. And me and the singer had been managing everything to do with the business band, all the finances and the money and the contracts and stuff like that. And they don't like that. They don't want people. Don't want the musicians to be talking about the business with the business people. Uh, that's how it is in America, anyway. Or at that time, that's how it was in America. And. <clears throat> And, you know, we were trying to, I suppose, take the next step. We wanted to be, you know, be, you know, as big as the Pixies or something like that. You know, we wanted to be like, like, you're indie, but you're good, you know, and you're successful, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, so they, we said, oh, fuck, we're not going to, what, pay him? Yeah. And if we do this deal, we're going to get an advance for this. And this guy we've just met, we're going to sign him and he's going to get 20% of that deal. And we've just done the deal ourselves. And the, the guy's said, yeah, well, that's that's how it goes. And we said, no, we won't do it. And uh, this is the great lesson is that 20% of nothing is nothing. <laughs> so nobody got anything. And uh, that was it. Uh, we came back to Australia. We made one more record against, uh, we went back to Tony Cohen because I was, I, I wanted to try and get back to, you know, the vibe we had on the first record. The vibe on the first record, which is called Such Sweet Thunder, which, uh, if you can get yourself a copy, you can. I don't know if it's on download on iTunes or not, but if you can have a listen to some of that, there's some, there's some pretty cool stuff. And on the second album, which was called Flame, there was a song called um, uh, What a Hell of a Woman, which has got some uh, signature Phil Calvert drumming on it. So there you go. <laughs> that jazz from hell kind of style. Well, the more that you're yeah, more the um. Oh, and there's a song of that called Killjaw. No, um, no, the uh, more the uh, yeah, it's just, it's the big kind of you know swing tom workout kind of thing. A la, yeah, yeah, like kind of like a slow down version of Zoo Music Girl, but not. Anyway. Now, after Blue Ruin, I was just looking at Wikipedia, so it could be incorrect. Correct me if I'm wrong. There was a few kind of one off albums that you appeared on up until I, the last one, stayed dating. Uh, with the enthusiasts in 2006, is this correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so that's a project, a studio project between me and a Melbourne guitar player who's really multi-instrumentalist kind of thing. Um, since then, I've done, uh, I produced and played uh, on an album for a girl called Seri Vita. I played on a, uh, an album for... Uh, a girl called Astrid Mundy. Um, I've played a session for a guy called John Justin. I've done drums on, uh, I've done a lot of um, more uh, engineering and producing other artists. I, there was a, there's a band called Terremoto who are half from uh, America and half from Melbourne. They, they're much kind of like yeah, they're, they're obviously slightly influenced by, you know, where I came from in the past. So they were interested in me producing them. We were doing it between two studios, one in the Bay Area in San Francisco, and one in my studio here. And like, so I was doing, they did the drums there. They came here, we put the bass and guitar on, went back there, they put the vocals and some keys, came back, I put some more keys on it and mixed it. Uh, and that came out on a label uh, in Germany and also here. And that, that band, Terremoto is a, a, a Italian word, means earthquake. Um, and uh, yeah, I worked with a band called the Witch Hats, who uh, uh, here, a witch hat or a witch's hat is what you guys call a traffic cone. Oh, okay. So, so they're called witch hats, but people, so it's not like they're spooky, weird. their thing is like traffic cones kind of thing. Anyway, um, so uh, they're really good. They, uh, their first, um, they did a, a, an EP called the, the Wound of a Little Horse, and then they did uh, a, uh, an album called uh, Cellulite Soul. And that's, um, that's 
got some uh they're, they're, they were very birthday party influenced so uh they um it was real fun being in the studio like getting those drum sounds and getting that tracy pew bass sound and all that kind of stuff and you know running shit tons of reverb on things it was yeah it was was a lot of fun mixing uh i'm not a fan of the final mix because the singer would never let me push his voice enough and i i, I, I have a real problem with that with uh quite a lot of indie records it, it, it depends on how they're mixed but if you know you listen to a birthday party record fuck the, vo the voice is right up here you, you know listen to Elvis listen to anything you can you can hear every word you know what's going on the voice is you know one of the loudest things these guys go oh, I don't like my voice so turn it down I go fuck that you know <laughs> anyway, anyway so uh and then so I've got a little record label called behind the beat records and I only really set that up because I'd made this one album and I couldn't get anyone to put it out uh, for this girl called Seri Vita. And uh, so I started a label to do that. And then since that, I've done um, uh, a guy co called Jethro Pickett. I did two records for the Witch Hats on my label. I did um, uh, another record for Seri. I did, um, oh, um, this uh, oh, a punk band called Masses, M-A-S-S-E-S. -S -S. Uh, I did a, a uh, and it was an EP or an album? Album, I can't remember. Anyway, uh, and so yeah, uh, and I'm working on another record at the moment. I've done. Uh, I've got these kids. They're kind of a little bit. What do you call it? Kind of doll core kind of stuff. That, you know, but they but they sing in tune, so it's okay. I I hate that stuff where they've got the girl vocalist who sings flat. I, I don't like those records. But yeah, and then uh, uh, you know, in the midst of all of this, uh, I have other lives where you know I've owned businesses and you know when you're a musician you, you're usually doing something else or have a gig that's uh, you know affording the equipment or paying for the rehearsals or the sessions while you're trying to get things together so um, I've worked in a lot of different businesses but uh, about uh, 20 years ago I was very fortunate uh, I met you know my fantastic wife we got married um, and that's been one of the best things that uh, happened to me uh, in my life and uh, not long after we got married, I was made redundant from a job I was working at that point in time where I was a export development manager for a cosmetics company. And uh, so I went and did all kinds of odd jobs for some time. But then uh, at the same time, Julia, my wife, had started her own business and it was growing uh, very successful. And so uh, one day, um, it was just, I came home and she was very distraught at not being able to cope with the amount of work that she had with her new business. And I said, well, I'll work in the business. I know how to do all that stuff anyway. It's all stuff I've done before. And she goes, oh, no, but it'll really jeopardize our marriage. And, you know, and all our friends said, oh, no, you don't work together. You'll kill each other. But um, it didn't work out that way. And so the last 16 years or so, we had this business together. It was very successful. And in uh, uh, March of 2019, we sold it because we had enough and uh, we were a bit disillusioned with the world we were in because we were selling a whole lot of stuff from China that was creating a lot of waste, a lot of packaging, a lot of everyone wanted everything in a gift box and a wrapper and a plastic bag and a styrofoam on the inside. And you go, I've got warehouses full of, you know, container loads of goddamn crap and it's just people are going to open that box and throw it all in a bin. And so we were feeling, you know, yeah. yeah. Well, we're at the we're at the the local produce market, and we've got our eco bag and putting our vegetables in it, so we don't use a plastic bag. And meanwhile, back at the warehouse, I've got fucking container loads of styrofoam. You know, I'm going no, you know. So then we sold it, and so that got us out of it. And then um, we weren't sure what we were going to do next, but uh, Julia wanted us to do something with upcycle and recycle, so we started this uh, this uh, sculpture uh, project, which. Um, uh, we, because it's collaboration between the two of us, we didn't want to call it Julia and Phil, and we didn't want to call it, you know, whatever. So we invented a kind of a character, and this character is kind of like the child we never had, and it's called Kitty Calvert. And so uh, we've got a, you can look it up on the website, folks, and follow us on the socials, Kitty Calvert. And we make, yeah, we make these crazy kind of, you know, uh, uh, messed up dystopian things with doll parts and tin toys and candelabras and you know bits of chandeliers and stuff and we bolt that all together into some crazy form and we sell them in art galleries and uh 
we've uh, been doing yeah pretty good i mean it's like we're not doing it you know to make a living for ourselves we're doing it because it's really you know creative and entertaining we enjoy working together we like all the scavenging like going to the you know the car boot sales and the you know the thrift stores and you know finding bits of junk oh, yeah. you don't know what it's going to be we've got this little workshop uh, in a local local arts precinct here and we store all the stuff there and we i've got a workbench and a whole lot of tools and we go down there and make crazy shit it's it's a lot of fun so i'm still doing the music um uh i've got yeah uh two kind of three things on the go with recording at the moment and and yeah the most of the time the rest of it is you know i spill and spend all my ill-gotten gains on drums and guitars and amplifiers and valve preamps and old microphones and all that kind of shit yeah now, uh for behind the beat records and kitty calvert how does distribution for that stuff look here in north america <clears throat> okay so um it, all of the stuff that's on Behind the Beat Records can be downloaded through iTunes. Uh, the, the physical product can be bought online and shipped to people in America um, through, um, uh, there's a distributor in Australia called MGM, which is not Metro Goldwyn Mayer, it's yeah. Metropolitan, Metropolitan Groove Merchants. And they're, they're a, a distributor here in Australia. Uh, they distribute my label and they're, they're also, they're an iTunes aggregator and they, so they do all the Spotify, all the YouTube, all the, all that kind of placement and everything for me. Uh, and they take a slice of, you know, all of the earnings from it as a result of that. But I like things to be distributed in, in what I call the real world. I mean, Bandcamp's cool and everything like that. Uh, although distributors don't really want people doing stuff on Bandcamp because it robs sales from them. But I just want the, the musicians to get as much as possible, mostly I'm usually financing the recording. Um, the deal I have with people uh, that are on my label is pretty much um, I um, recoup the costs. And once I recoup the costs, uh, I go like 80, 20, like, or eight or 90, 10, like I take 10% or 20%. Because if, if you can get to the thing where you can actually, and I don't care if they sell the records at gigs or whatever, you know, but everybody wants to do vinyl. Vinyl's expensive for me to manufacture. So you've got to say, hey, if the vinyl stiffs and everything like that, you've got to take it off my hands at cost, you know? So, I mean, uh, so I'm very, I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make a lot of money. I'd like, I want to uh, encourage and help uh, bands that I think have got something going on or that I want to encourage uh, or, you know, give them the leg up or the break that I got from having my first deal or, you know, or g giving people a shot or seeing that they can, they can actually have product and, 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 you know, you know, be somebody, but I said, but you've got to do the work. I don't do the promotion. I don't go around to everybody. You know, I don't go to all the radio stations and take direct. I said, you've got to do that stuff. You know, I'll print the bios for you. I'll make this, you know, I'll give you the envelopes or that, but you know, you've got to do some work too, you know, because I'm paying for everything. Um, but so, yeah, I'm always looking for something uh, new and quirky. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm also trying, yeah, no, I don't, I don't want to get into stuff that's like too uh, overproduced and on the grid and like totally freaking logic to death. You know, I, I like, you know, I like spilling my microphones. I like I like, you know, I like to hear people breathing when they're singing and all that kind of stuff. I, you know, I don't want to make a Taylor Swift record. You know. All right, and uh, two quick questions there before we get to just uh, basically that will end the episode with you plug in where we can go to get your stuff through uh, Kitty Calvert or Behind the Beat. Uh, that's, that's, that's all good. I mean, I, 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 we can do that, but I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not kind of the reason I'm here. I mean, I'd be, I'd be interested if people want to go and look at the sculptures we make, yeah, that's fun. If you know, if people want to look at you know what things are, you know, they can go to my Behind the Beat website and look and see shit that I've released and watch videos and look at stuff. I mean, yeah, that's fine. Um, just yeah, and it would be really nice if uh, something happened that uh, you know we got offered to show some of our sculptures in a gallery in Madrid, but it's been like, you know, I mean, I would get on a plane for two years, you know, kind of thing. So yeah. I, you know, I, I was I was supposed to be coming to your part of the world actually to visit an old friend. You, are you where are you in Ottawa? Uh, no, I'm in um, Vancouver Island. Oh, yeah. oh you're on so that side. Okay. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 
Vancouver, great, awesome place. Had a bit of a reputation for being a bad junkie town there for a while, though. Yeah, downtown Vancouver has its spots, but the, the island is a lot more rural. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's beautiful up around there. I mean, uh, oh, I remember being in, in uh, Seattle, you know, and I was uh, like up that way, you know, in Puget Sound and stuff yeah. like that. A fucking killer whale jumps out of the fucking water. You yeah. Know, you know? yeah. Don't see that every day, you know. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. All right, so uh, two questions. As a Canadian, I, I would be amiss if I didn't ask, did Neil Pert do anything for you at all? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the drum question. Yes, the, the professor. He's good. <laughs> uh, certainly after, certainly when he reinvented himself after, um, you know, he did all those uh, uh, lessons and changed his grip and everything like that. Uh, uh, I'm not a massive Rush fan. Uh, so I suppose that if if I was really into the music, then it might mean a lot more to to me. You know, I always wonder if Getty Lee talks the same as the way he sings. Um, you know, talks up here. You know, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, but um, yeah, um, uh, yeah. It's, look, I've got. A, I'm a I'm a huge fan of a lot of Canadians. Right, I, I'm a massive Neil Young fan. A massive Joni Mitchell fan. America have been claiming those guys for fucking years. Gene Pitney, he's Canadian. You know, I mean, a lot of these guys, you know, that they, but they crossed the border because that's where the studios and where the money was, you know. But uh, yeah, Neil particularly is like, you know, and and I and yeah, and I like it, you know, that he sticks it up Spotify and he does, you know, whatever he can, you know, he tries to make electric cars or whatever, and collects train sets, you know. I mean, good on him. He's he's amazing, you know. All right, in a controversial moment, all right, here we go. The ARIA Awards. When Nick took to the stage for his induction, he took it upon himself to induct the members of the birthday party, but he stiffed you out of the roll call. What happened there? Did you ever have a conversation with him about it? And what were your feelings at the time? At the time, I was, I was gobsmacked. I was, I was watching it on television myself. I wasn't at the, the, the thing. Um, which technically I should have been invited to. Um, you would and, think. Uh, you would think. And um, you can't believe that the, 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 my telephone fucking jumped out of the air with everybody in fucking Melbourne that knew me going, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> you know, everyone's going, what was, what was, what, what, what was that? What, you know? And uh, I spoke to, I didn't speak to Nick about it. I spoke to Mick Harvey about it um, some years later. And he went, oh, you know, Nicky's never really that together, only ever really thinking about himself, you know, just forgot. And I went, yeah. Anyway, look, Nick and I are really sweet these days. Um, uh, we exchange very uh, uh, pleasant, uh, you know, greetings around birthdays. I was very, um, uh, uh, I can't tell you how freaked out and sad I was when his son died. I thought that, I, I just go, how much more bad shit can happen to Nick in his life, really? I just went, he's got it all together. He's sorted out all of his shit. He's got his, you know, he's got good management now. He's got great deals on his records. He's doing the kind of music that he wants. He's really exploring a lot of stuff and everything that you think, you know, he's got these two gorgeous kids. He's got this beautiful wife. He's, you know, nice house in down there in, Bath, and, no, sorry, what am I saying? In fucking Brighton, you know, and uh, Hove, and you know, uh, then 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 that, you know, I was just like, fuck, you know, and then yeah, Anita dying last year, that was really sad too. So yeah, I write to him when when good and bad things happen, when his mother passed away, when his when Anita died, you know, uh, his birthday, my birthday, like you know, it's just that kind of thing. It's you know, whenever he comes to to town, you know, since then I've seen him, you know plenty of times backstage having beers with him. Well, not that he drinks, but, you know, after shows and he always puts me on the guest list for show. I've always had great tickets, you know, for great seats for his shows and stuff like that. So everything's sweet with him and me. I don't, you know, people, what? I get over stuff. Some people don't get over stuff. There's a whole bunch of people in, in this town that were around for that scene from kind of like, the, which, which revolved around a couple of key venues. Uh, one called the Crystal Ballroom and uh, the Prince of Wales and the, and the venue. So around this kind of St Kilda area and a whole bunch of those people, like, you know, their friends on you know, Facebook and, and stuff like that. They write like 
that was the greatest moment in their whole life and nothing's ever been good about their life ever since. That being part of that scene and being with those people and then in that musical moment, in that scene in St Kilda, that was like, that was like gold and the rest of their life has been crap. But my life's not like that. You know, my life has been a series of, you know, really fantastic occurrences. There's been ups, there's been downs, you know, bad things happen, parents die, you know, uh, but really you've got to just put that stuff go and go, well, get up the next morning and go, what am I doing now? You know, do something different, you know, man, COVID lockdown was fantastic. I haven't practiced that much in years. My chops are so good now, you know, really. I'm, and there's all these fantastic cats on YouTube. Some of them are terrible, but some of them can actually teach or can explain. And yeah, man, I, yeah, I did more, more practice on the lockdown than I've done in years. And it was great. You know? So you could just sit at home going, hey, lockdown, it's really shit. You know, we had 260 days of lockdown in Melbourne over two years. So it's like, yeah, there was bits where you couldn't go outside five kilometers from your house, but I live really near the beach. So I can walk on the beach every morning, you know? So I'm happy about that. You know? Not a bad gig at all. No, it's good. If you come this way, you can drop in and, uh, if I get up to Vancouver, I'll look you up. <laughs> Sounds good. I will keep that in mind. All right. Now, uh, I will put the links. Just send them to me, and I'll put as many links as you want in the description of the video. But tell the people where they can go to support you, the bands that you're uh, backing right now, and the projects between you and the missus. Okay, fantastic. Well, Thanks for that, Tyler. Yeah, well, uh, the sculpture project is called Kitty Calvert, and you can find that on Instagram and on Facebook. And uh, there is a website, www.kittycalvert.com, all one word. And uh, then there's uh, my record label, which is Behind the Beat Records. Uh, there's a website for that, www.behindthebeatrecords.com. And uh, there you can uh, see all the various releases, and uh, there'll be links to videos and whatnot. If you like the look or the sound of any of the artists, it's all available for download, or you can look for the MGM website in Australia, which is the Metropolitan Groove Merchants, and you would be able to buy the actual physical product from them and they will ship it to you anywhere in the world. Um, but uh, so that's if you, you know, really piqued the interest. There's a lot of this stuff uh, I may or may not play on. And uh, some of the stuff I don't just play drums. So uh, I'll be broad, you know, broadening my skill set, so to speak. If, you, if you're interested in any of that, it's been uh, really fun talking to you, Tyler. I've uh, enjoyed the questions and the, the, the journey that it's taken me on in, in answering the questions. So the, it's, uh, it's fun to look back at those times. And uh, I do look back on them with uh, fond memories. And uh, I'm very proud of uh, a lot of the music I made with those people. And uh, I'm, I'm sad for the ones uh, that are no longer with us. But uh, that's uh, that's life. Thanks again so much, Mr. Calvert. <laughs> it's all good, man. You just chop that up however you want. And uh, when it when it do you, do, does it go to air at a particular time or date or when when does it go live or? Um, not any particular time, but I will send it to you before I put it out there. Oh, just just send me the link when you do it. You know, I'm not going to go. You can't put that in. If I said it, I said it. It's all good. <laughs> Oh, I was going to go over and edit a bunch of horrible stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Bordeaux, he's got his book right. Uh, it just went from hardcover to paperback. And he wanted to do a teaser for it, kind of like on the internet and all this and boost post on it. And there's, it's coming in the UK and then some bookstores in America are doing Q&As with him like this kind of stuff and everything. Um, but he wanted to have some music in the background of it. I said... I'll make you 45 seconds of shit that sounds like the birthday party. No worries. <laughs> so I just, so I just made, you know, just some squealy roll and feedback guitar and things like that over this loping bass line with these sort of, you know, big swinging drums and stuff and loads of reverb and just sent it to him. And yeah, looks great. I'll, I'll, if I find the thing, I'll send you a link. It's hilarious because people, you know, people are actually going, Oh man, you know, but yeah, they, some people think it's something that's been cut out of an actual birthday party track, but it's not. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. Eh? I wish you nothing but success and good health. All right. And thanks so much for that, Tyler. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Okay. Over and out. Bye. <laughs> Bye.